uh, thank you so much for, for joining us, Stephen. Um, okay. So why don't we begin with, uh, through your book, it just makes clear how, how much more important really it is to put it out there, these stories, uh, stories like uh, of um, Harjit Singh Malik, for example. Absolutely. The, the, challenge, the challenge is for, for someone in the UK who wants to tell those global stories is that there are so, there are so few of them. But there's no doubt about it that in Britain in particular, the impact of the First World War centenary in relation to British people knowing about India's contribution, the percentage of population who has impacted on has doubled up to 70 odd percent if you ask members of the British public about that and that was because of those themes that we've been talking about the global war the Indian contribution most British people like myself who've been you know I'm a first war historian we've been running these themes for 35 40 years as I have through our many mainly initiated by our family connections most British people know about the other Dominion forces, the Australians, the Canadians, the New Zealanders, the South Africans. The Indian contribution, and we can talk about why that was, that's a fascinating discussion about why that was. It wasn't well known, and it's really important in modern Britain for us to understand that story. Because of course we have huge South Asian communities here in Britain, many of them, many of whom are here, because of the military connection in the past. Absolutely. And um, it's just healthy to understand the reality and the true proportions of India's huge contribution in the first and of course the second world wars. And the things that I have read before uh, about the first world war, world war before, uh, it seems that the contribution of these dominions, especially like Australia and, and Canada, uh, th the identity of a nation of nationhood was born out of these experiences in their in, in the First World War, especially for the Canadians in bad battles like, uh, I guess, Battle of Arras was or or uh, the other battles where they were present present present. And for example, the New Zealanders and Australians uh, in in Gallipoli, for example. Yeah. So, uh, but that same kind of thing is not really spoken about uh, uh, about the Indian contribution, as as you mentioned before, right? Am I right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, until the First World War centenary, which, yeah, which right. gave it a huge impetus, that knowledge and understanding throughout the Western world, I would argue, actually, for the mm. first time. And um, I think it's important to remember that the Australians and the Canadians and the South Africans, New Zealanders, they had dominion status. So they had a degree of autonomy. Mm. But the First World War gave them impetus to full autonomy within what became, of course, eventually the empire and the Commonwealth, of course. Um, India, India, of course, is a very different case that it didn't have dominion status. And um, we can talk, if you'd like to talk a bit about that, we could talk at length mm -hmm. about why, why, why that was. And one thing I will say is that the commander of the India Corps always believed that the Indian story would not be told. In 19, after the Indians left to go to Mesopotamia, the India Corps left the Western Front in December 1915 to go to Mesopotamia for the most part. That's the Meerut Division, the Hoare Division. Um, the commander of the, of the India Corps believed that that story would not be told it, for all sorts of reasons. And he was absolutely right about mm. that. I think he had a sense probably of how things would play out in the future. And um, in a, in, in a very subtle way, that also comes out from your book that the British administration really didn't have any any intention, or rather would uh, would much rather not continue the the idea of commissions after the war, right? Yeah, that was that was the smoking <laughs> gun in that story. Yeah. That was a, that was a, uh, it was something I was not ready to find. You know, once that decision had been made to by the Secretary of State Montague, who I've come to have great sympathy for. Once that decision had been made, I believed that there was no going back. But literally, as soon as the war is coming to an end, there is no further requirement to recruit Indian sepoys, particularly in the northwest, in Punjab, northwest frontier, and so forth, to really push that recruitment in 1918. Because Britain is running short of soldiers, 
on the Western Front in particular, and then the war ends. I'll leave it when I'm doing my presentation to audiences here, I'll leave a gap. And the war ends, those um, offers to give Indians full King's Commission status to Indians with the same level as British officers, that is reneged upon. Like that. As soon as the war ends, and Montague, who's writing after the war, and many of the, to be fair, many of the liberal officers, at, not just within the Air Force, but in the India office in particular, they are scandalised by that. But the political weight is against them, particularly by the, the British military, by the army, the war office. They will have no truck with it, and yeah. they're delighted that it's gone. Absolutely. You've made that very clear in the book many times. Yeah. And it's very important for that. And I, I actually just want to touch upon the Indian side of it. How, how do we today look at it, look at this whole history? It's not, it's, it's very sad, actually, very sad and very unfortunate that this period of the contribution of Indian uh, dominions, sorry, Indian soldiers, so many of them in the First World War has been, now it is usually looked upon as you know, Indian soldiers going and fighting for someone else's war, and especially the British Empire's war, which is not, and, and the contributions and and not necessarily the contribution, they don't even look at it as a contribution to anything. Uh, their service is actually not commemorated, not looked upon and studied and, and spoken about much, much until we have uh, stories like this. And I think uh, we can finally get to the story of Hadith Singh Malik now. He was born in Rawalpindi in 1894. They were not particularly well off, a lower middle class family. The key thing to know about him and his family is that at that time in the 18, at the turn of the century, the British are establishing Rawalpindi as the great military base of the empire, not just in India, of the empire. Rawalpindi, huge military base. And his father benefits from building contracts. Financially, many people ask me, how did Malik come to be educated in Britain? Well, his father developed sufficient wealth to fund that, and that was through contracts within Rawalpindi. And because of that financial benefit, his father was able to make financial choices on behalf of not just Hadit Singh, but his, his brothers as well. And as a result of that, his father believed that the local schools in Rawalpindi did not give the sort of education that he believed that his sons warranted. And as a result of that, there was a nearby British college and he was able to recruit British educated. They were Indians, but they were British educated university lecturers to come and pay tuition to his sons. He learns traditional British university education or preparation for a, a, a university education in Britain. So he learns um, about literature, about um, classics, about the arts. He also learns the importance of sports, certainly not golf, but cricket, hockey, and soccer in particular. And then just to jump the story forward a little bit, his elder brother, Tesh uh, Singh, has already gone to Britain, followed a similar path, Malik, Hadit Singh Malik will follow. And the young 14 year old, who's obviously, he's developed, he's a sort of, he's got a, a precociousness about him. He believes that he wants to go to Britain alone to be educated at a public school. He wants to, as preparation for joining the Indian Civil Service. Uh, and as a result of that, he, he travels alone in 1909 as a 14 year old. And what's important about that, he was as well prepared, I would argue, he was as well prepared as any person from abroad coming to be Britain to be educated in the public school system and the, edu and the university system as anybody could be. And that's a hugely important moment. Absolutely. And it's so, it must be, it must have been so uh, challenging. I mean, it's a huge challenge. Can you imagine a 14 year old crossing uh, this, such a huge distance uh, all by himself? And you've you've painted a brilliant picture of that in the book, and it was a very you know it was really fun to read. What were his impressions when he first came to the UK? Yeah, absolutely, yes. It was it was a challenge. It was uh, some interesting things that I learned. For example, that, that there were no passports at that time for the first war. You didn't need a passport. And his father, as it says in the book, you know, his father made his travelling 
condition of his traveling the fact that he had to make all the travel arrangements himself right. from Raoul Pindi and with his brother Ej in in London uh, because his mother was opposed to her son traveling at that age well that's not a surprise of course I would, I would as a father I would think twice about that today but those are different times and um, I think what's interesting about that is that Malik himself when he's interviewed in Oxford by one of the committees who, who were asking about conditions for Indian students at British universities, Malik said actually, yeah, I probably, he, he, he sort of infers it was probably not a good idea me coming as a 14 year old. That's the 21 year old Malik with the sort of wisdom of life and the First World War. He says, yeah, that's probably not a good idea, but the 14 year old had no qualms, but that's 14 year olds, isn't it? Absolutely. And it's very interesting to read uh, about, uh, you know, how he quickly got acquainted because of, as you said, that because of his uh, liberal uh, English education, at least prep school that was done by English professors uh, back in Rawalpindi, he was able to quickly, uh, you know, cultivate friendships and influence, uh, you know, it made a good impression on people that he met, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the best way I can explain this is the fact that most most Indians who came to Britain before the First World War to be educated at universities came as 18 year olds straight into a British university education sector. And that was very what they did. It was what they didn't know. They didn't know, which is the public school Public school education is not just about academia, it's not about study, it's also about character building, sports and jocularity, you know, the sort of socialising with other members of the British middle and upper classes, not all of whom are interested in study. And many Indians could not believe the lack of seriousness there was among some British students, but the serious part of that is that they often found it difficult to fit in because they had no often no interest in sports were very serious academic often could be isolated and sometimes of course you know it ends up with knots of indians becoming isolated in british universities nehru's own father you know his advice to his son is don't just stay with other indians his two other indian his two other cousins were at cambridge and nehru motilal uh, Nehru says to his son, don't just meet with your cousins because you will become isolated. All three of you will become isolated. That is very much out of the Malik playbook, the Hadith Singh Malik playbook. That for a different reason, the fact that he was on his own, he'd been given in Ralpindi a much of a, a very good grounding and preparation for the public schools. And the fact that Malik played cricket and hockey and then would teach himself golf. That, en that enabled him to be welcomed into that public school setting. I can't emphasize to your listeners that enough. The mm. fact that public school setting, which is was totally foreign to other Indian students, but not to Hardit Singh Malik and not to Nehru. Both of them are totally comfortable with the sort of public school ethos and Western educated people from Britain throughout their lives. Absolutely. And also, uh, uh, could you could you just touch upon the uh, the aspect of guardianship that the Indian students have to ha have to endure? Um, and I think, uh, and just for your, if you could just explain what guardianship means to, to our viewers. And um, it was very interesting to find that Harjit Singh didn't have so much of a of an issue with guardianship. He actually very, gelled very well with his uh, with the people that he had to put up. Uh, Right at the right at the beginning when he went to Eastbourne, right? Yeah. In terms of guardianship, before the First World War, among many Indian students who were coming to be university educated in Britain, and there's about two thousand of them before the First World War. Many of them in London. About forty percent are in London. Many of them can see that Britain is a free country, and it emphasises the fact that India is not free. A number of those Indian students come what we would now say radicalized in terms of they are going to promote Indian home rule, 
Indian independence. And some of them, of course, take part in violent activity. Many of them don't. They just take part in what the British authorities consider to be seditious activities. We would just say it's a diversity of opinion today. Well, it depends in which context we're saying that. Yeah. Um, but the University of Oxford, um, what's called guardianship is introduced, whereby each Indian student was allocated a, a British, um, almost like a British governor, someone who would look after their interests. Now, for Hardit Singh Malik, who had been educated with Western educated tutors in Rawalpindi, and also because when he'd arrived in Britain, I don't think either he or his family back in Rawalpindi, and by the way, Tej left, his brother Tej left after one year. I think it suddenly dawned on them, this is me extrapolating from the evidence, actually, what, are we, what am I going to do during the long summer holidays in Britain? And he fell on the kindness of his tutors who looked after him. He, he would have that kindness from people. In 1916, he's still living in the upper rafters attics of Balliol because of the kindness of his tutor who's putting up because he has nowhere else to go. And I think money from Raoul Pindi is drying up as well. So I think that the, the, while men, most Indian students at the universities are given guardians to look after their interests, they see these guardians as being very suspicious who are actually monitoring their political activities or just monitoring their lives in a way that British students did not have to put up with. And if you're 18, 19, you do not want a 43-year-old looking after your interests. Hardit Singh, Hardit Singh, he was completely comfortable with that. He was, I had the sense that he was comfortable with it. So he, I think I've said in the book, he... Um, he befriends one of the fast bowlers at Balliol, and it just happens that um, Brooker's father is a guardian, and it's Malik's guardian. And so he, he, they probably have lunch together, and it's all very nice socially. He's, the serious point is he's very comfortable with that company, mainly because he's had to, he's had to fall on the largesse of many of these tutors during his time in Britain, because that has not been thought through. I'm clear on that. That has not been thought through. What is he going to do during the summer holidays? All the other students have gone. And I think somebody will have said to him, what are you doing, Hardit Singh? Well, he's not going back to Rawalpindi. He can't afford that. And therefore, these relationships are really important. So he has to get on very well with British people, other Indian students, were not as comfortable with it and also that was not something that they wanted to do. But that doesn't mean to say that Hardit Singh was not a patriotic Sikh and Indian. He just got a different background and he draws on that capital. His experiences with um, casual and severe forms of racism were, have been pointed out uh, in, like, very, in, very, in great clarity throughout the book. Could you just touch upon that and how actually that kind of molded his character in another, in, in an even important manner? I would say that actually enhanced his view that, um, you know. Um, I think the first thing to say is that if you were, if you were one of those 2000 Indians in Britain at the start of the First World War, many of them wanted to join up. They believed that they could do so because if you wanted to join the Indian Civil Service, there was no bar to that. If you wanted to join the legal profession, there was no, there was no bar to it. Eventually, there, there was a bar high, if you went high enough up within the legal profession. But actually, on entry into the legal profession, there was no problem. And just so your viewers just set this context within which this story takes place. However, you wanted to join the British Army because you happened to be in Britain as, and you were a British subject, that's also important to emphasise, you could not do that. That was a very difficult thing to do, even if you wanted to join at the rank of private. This is a bit, you know, it's an uncomfortable thing for me to describe, but under the manual of military law, since 1857, war of Indep the first war of independence, Indians 
people of colour are described as either aliens or natives in terms of wanting to gain access to British military forces. So Malik himself, he attempts to be recruited about four or five times. Balliol College is, itself is a recruiting office. So you've got Malik with, number one, all of his friends have gone off to join the war. He's left on his own with the old people, like myself, age, and, and those people who are not fit for service. And I think that was infuriating to him because he wanted to join the war. And eventually, we can perhaps talk, unpack this a little bit later if you'd like to, but eventually he is enabled by people in authority, as one part, to join the Royal Flying Corps. But also, Britain has a need to expand the potential pool of officers, particularly in the Royal Flying Corps. And that's a, an important part. Uh, of, uh, it's an important part of this story. And perhaps we can unpack that in a minute, but just talking yeah. about what was called at the time racialism, racialism and how Malik steered through that. I think what I would say is that he believed that Britain was, Britain as he found it, and the British as he found them in 1914, let's say, he saw it as two separate nations, liberal Britain, and he'd had a liberal education, um, he had a, which had given him, he says in his autobiography, an appreciation of different beliefs and appreciation of the value of the rule of law and of British education. And that gave him what I would have described as an aesthetic and idealised attachment to Britain, while at the same time opposing imperialism. And how do, how do you hold those two opposing views in your head? I think the way that Malik did it was that he didn't blame individual people. He had a lot of individual plan. He had lots of individual friends, and you can say that this is a naive view. And this is my view of somebody who was back a hundred years ago. Partition is fifty years away, and you're trying to rationalise how you're going to manage these tensions, negotiate relationships, and so forth in reality. And if anybody wants to be critical of Malik, you need to put yourself back. 100 years in those circumstances, what would you do? It's, it's a different question to asking you in July of 2022. Um, and as a result of that, Malik didn't blame individual people who were around him, but he did blame the policies of government and the Raj. And what infuriated him most was not little petty instances of um, he gave a wonderful interview in Hindi, actually, in, in, oh, in the late 70s. And he says, you know, there were petty instances of racialism. He said, I had so many British friends that I could just ignore it because I knew that that was not a majority view. What infuriated him was the policy obstructions that were put in his way by the government. They were governmental obstructions that were put in his way either in Delhi by the Raj or in Britain. And, for example, he had to produce a certificate to receive his pay. All the other British pilots joined the queue to be paid. Even in, 19, even in early 1918, Malik is having to produce an identity certificate as an alien to receive pay. And what does he do? He's got friends, a former, as it says in the book, former High Court judge of Madras, Right to another friend in the India office, the wheels start turning. That's one part of it, the personal thread. At a political level, the Secretary of State for India, Montague, is also mounting this campaign to get Indians the same status as King's Commission's officers in Britain's armed forces. And it starts to move in 1918. Well, that's, that, that's, a, that's a brilliant way to put that into perspective, uh, Stephen. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that. So uh, I think we could come and start talking about a little bit about his uh, inclination towards joining up the British Armed Forces. Of course, as you said that, you know, once the war started, it had a kind of a, not kind of, it actually did have a negative impact on his life. And his inclination towards joining up was, uh, you know, was basically pushed further. And could you talk about the, his journey through that and uh, his involvement in, uh, as an ambulance driver? in France, once the war had begun. 
and uh, we'll come uh, uh, once you've explained this part we can go to the next part which is uh, him joining up with the rfc yeah. sure yeah i think i think that just to finalize about what's happening in the war malik would have been very aware that the india corps has arrived on the western front 150,000 indians to shore up the british army on the western front on its western flank in october of 1914 and that would, so all of his friends have gone from Balliol, as I've mentioned. You've got the India Corps on the Western Front that have arrived. The casualties are pouring in to Brighton, to the Brighton hospitals, to be treated there. And when Malik attempts to join up, which he does four or five times, the best thing that is offered is that he can go and be a medical orderly down at Brighton, treating India Corps, office, uh, India Corps soldiers. And one, by the way, one of the reasons for that is that the, they've decided that nurses cannot be in, in contact with those soldiers. White British nurses and females cannot be in touch with those soldiers. And they're looking for male orderlies, all right? That's, that's, that's part of that story. Mm -hmm. Malik wants to help the war effort. And through his contacts in Oxford, particularly his tutor, who happens to just be a, a trustee of the Red Cross, London, um, Malik is enabled to join the French Red Cross and the Battle of Verdun is taking place, a massive battle, huge battle on the Western Front at Verdun between the French and the Germans in February and as a result of that the French are hugely short of ambulances in their hospitals. And Malik is enabled to drive a publicly subscribed ambulance in Britain down to, to Cognac in Western France, which has got a lot of specialist hospitals. It does specialist treatments for face skin grafts, um, eye treatments. Right. Also. I actually wanted to ask you about this, that I was a little surprised that where, as an ambulance driver, he was posted so far from the front line. I actually wanted to ask you this, but how come this was, uh, I was actually taken aback a little, little bit. Yeah, it's because in Cognac, there were many hospitals and of course, where have all their ambulances gone from Cognac? They've gone to Verdun. East, for your for your viewers, Verdun is on the border with close to the border with Germany. And Cognac is in Western France. So absolutely right, your question. You know, why is Malik sent to Cognac? Well, the reason is is one, the ambulances have been taken from Cognac to support the hospitals where they're needed on the Eastern Front. There are significant numbers of hospitals in Cognac giving specialist treatment. So the casualty clearance at Verdun, which relates to Malik, is that soldiers are treated very close to the front line at the Verdun, and then they're sent all over France for treatment because the numbers are huge. We're talking about millions of casualties. And therefore, Malik's ambulance, it's decided, is required cognac to service the hospitals because the trains that are bringing all these casualties from Verdun in eastern, Fra in eastern France are unloading thousands of casualties in western France in cognac and Malik it's decided not by Malik it's decided by the Red Cross and the French hospital authorities we need this ambulance here in cognac so he's sent to cognac the great the important thing about that is that he can become an officer in the Red Cross the French Red Cross, the Croix Rouge uh, Française, and as a result of that, he's able to mix with French officers as an officer. Yeah, so I think uh, we can um, continue to, uh, you know, to, to the point where how, and how his interest in flying, uh, uh, Hardit Singh's Malik, uh, Singh Malik's um, interest in flying uh, kind of grew and uh, Take us through that trajectory as 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 he joined the Royal uh, Flying Corps, as it was known back then, because uh, as you clearly mentioned, that the Royal Air Force was only uh, came about to be in 1918, and before it was known as the Royal Flying Corps. So yeah, Stephen. Yeah, I think the important thing for your for your viewers to know is that Malik's got no interest in flying until he goes to France. The idea, you know, this is a, this is a young bloke, you know, 18, 19, 20. He's coming up to 1920. Got no interest in flying when he goes to France. And then he's in the officer's mess, starts to um, 
mix with French flying officers. French flying corps is called the Militaire Aeronautique. And um, one thing that, in order to understand why he wants to join the flying corps, is that in 1916, it's the great era in the press, both in Britain and France, where I'm, I'm going to generalize terribly here, but everyone's sick and tired of the trenches, French warfare, and the slaughter on the Western Front. Everyone they want, they want personal stories, they want different stories, and where better than to go in the air? And what you have is that you get very personal stories of the fighter aces, and aces somebody who, in Britain at least has, has shot down, I think it's five victims. Okay, Many of the people that maybe your viewers know are people like Baron Richthofen on the German side, Albert Ball for Britain, uh, Mick Manock, and in France, the great fighter ace of 1916, although later he's to be killed, not long after Malik gets to know about him, is Georges Guinemer, and he, he has 50 killed. And it's really difficult. Um, he, you know, Georges Guinemer is the Virat Kohli of France, okay, in 1916. You know, his wife's known about, his girlfriend's known about, you know, his whole life is unpicked in the popular media. He, he is well known. And Malik, I think he's, he's, you know, he's, um, he becomes part of this enthusiasm in France. You know, he can read the media. Dina Mayer's personal faces, it's the anonymity of the, by comparison with the anonymity of the Western Front, the faceless slaughter of thousands, and suddenly you've got these handsome young men who are seen as chivalrous knights of the air. And Malik is drawn into that, and, you know, this is a young bloke story, isn't it? You know, oh, I fancy being a fighter pilot. Just like that. And um, so in these discussions in the mess, he's given a hint. It's only a hint that he might join the French Flying Corps. And I can imagine these officers saying, come and join us. We'd love to have you. And, um, and Malik writes back to his tutor, Francis Urquhart, Sligar Urquhart at Balliol, and says, look, the French Flying Corps would like to recruit me. I think Malik probably exaggerates that a little bit because he's, he says later he's only given a hint that he might join, and he never actually tries to join, I don't think. And as a result of that, as a British subject, as a, a British citizen, his tutor at Oxford is furious that the French could be recruiting one of British subject. What does that say about Britain? Now, and this is again, this is about connections, isn't it? So, I will just take time to tell your viewers this. The chap who who took the Royal Flying Corps to war in 1914 was a chap called David Henderson. Now, David Henderson, he had by 1916 he'd left that job and he'd got a desk job in Whitehall, in London. But guess what? He's also a trustee of the Red Cross in London. And Malik's tutor, Urquhart, and David Henderson know each other. And Urquhart writes to Henderson, the former head of the Royal Flying Corps, and I'm paraphrasing here, it's a more complex story. But basically what happens is there is a discussion at the India office, particularly at the India office, saying... How is it? This is embarrassing. This is Lord Islington, the Under Secretary of State. The French are going to recruit one of our own subjects. This is so embarrassing from a political point of view. The timing is perfect. That's what. So Malik is called for an interview from Konya, and he, you know, he goes straight away. We're going to take you in. There's what Malik didn't know. His death was that his timing was perfect because without being a, without giving this book the British Air Force the Royal Flying Corps is running short during the Battle of the Somme in 1916 of pilots and observers and as a result of that the Royal Flying Corps and the India office have come to an agreement that a number of Indians are going to be recruited to see how they get on the possibility of filling the gap because they're short. The then head of the Royal Flying Corps, Lord Trenchard, he actually says, if we don't recruit more people, we're going to lose this war. 
because we need air power. We're running short of pilots. So many lost in, on the Somme, over the Somme in 1916. So Malik's timing is perfect. So what he didn't know is that he was one of five Indians who were recruited in the window up to March of 1917, including Malik in November of 16. And then the window shuts on Indian recruitment into the Royal Flying Corps. No more are recruited until the middle of 1918. Well, Stephen, it was a brilliant conversation with you. And thank you so much for joining us. It was, um, I had so much fun. Uh, really, we had actually a really fun conversation. It was not Good. really, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it was great to talk to a historian who who was an expert on this period and also, um, because of the love of my uh, uh, my love for military history, but also for our viewers and and how um, uh, for them to know the backstory of such a person like Hardit Singh Malik and uh, others like him. <clears throat> well, thank you. It's uh, it's been a joy to talk to you, um, and uh, thank you very much for having me and, and sharing that story. I appreciate it.